Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So uh, this video is going to be the first in a new series that I'm looking to start up on the channel. And basically this series is going to be sort of like a post-mortem analysis of any stocks that I have now completely exited, completely sold out of. And I don't expect videos in this series to be particularly frequent. Um, generally speaking, I'm trying to buy into a small number of businesses that I can own for a long period of time. Uh, but every now and then I do sell completely out of something, either because I've made a mistake or because the price has got egregiously high uh, and I think it's trading well above its intrinsic value. So um, this is going to be the first video in that series and we're actually going to be looking at Fiat Chrysler which has now been renamed after a merger to Stellantis and this is actually the first business that I've had to take a permanent loss of capital on. So uh, this is my biggest investing mistake to date and I basically want to go through uh, what was the original investment thesis, why did I buy it, what ended up happening, why did I sell it and what kind of my returns were from that particular investment. So I do hope you enjoy it. Before we get into the topic of today's video, uh, we do have a sponsor for this one and the sponsor for today's video is Hatch. Now Hatch have been my personal broker of choice for me as a Kiwi doing all of my US investing for the past couple of years or so now. I initially switched across to Hatch basically purely to save on fees. Uh, buying shares overseas from here in New Zealand has been notoriously expensive, um, particularly before Hatch was around. I was paying 90 US dollars a trade with one of the banks here in New Zealand and I can now do those same trades for three US dollars in Hatch. So um, it's been a big money saver and the platform has also been sort of constantly improving as I have been a customer. And one of their more recent additions is with kids accounts. So if you want to get compounding starting early for your kids, you can now set up kids accounts through Hatch, which actually have even lower fees than the traditional brokerage accounts Hatch offer. So you can buy and sell shares for as little as 50 US cents. So uh, that's always nice, particularly if you're investing smaller amounts of money to be able to keep as much of that money as possible invested and not have lots of these frictional costs that eat away at your compounded returns over time. So if you're interested in checking out Hatch, you will need to go to the link hatch.as forward slash investing with Tom. If you go to that link, sign up and start a new Hatch account and deposit 100 New Zealand dollars into that account, you'll get a free $20 top up so that you can get started investing with a little bit more money. Okay, so Fiat Chrysler slash Stellantis. Uh, I'm just going to start this video off by putting my uh, returns from this particular investment up on the screen here. So this is a screenshot out of my ShareSite account, which will show you that I have captured a negative 16% return from uh, investing in Fiat Chrysler. So it's my first ever sort of permanent loss of capital. Thankfully, it wasn't negative 50% or anything crazy. Uh, but nonetheless, I did uh, take a hit on this one. And of course, Rule number one is don't lose money. So I did break rule number one with this particular investment. Now, um, I will say that uh, when I say that Fiat Chrysler is my worst ever investment, uh, that doesn't mean that I've had other stocks in my portfolio that aren't down more than 16%. Had a couple of stocks actually down around 50% at certain points in time, but they've always been good businesses that have really given me the opportunity to buy more and uh, they've generally recovered uh, far beyond my purchase price and well above intrinsic value, which has been very nice. But Stellantis is one that I did lock in a permanent loss of capital with. And although I sold most of my stake in Stellantis uh, over a year ago at this point, I actually held a small amount of that stake, so I kept holding on to about 30% of my Fiat Chrysler slash Stellantis position, uh, and I sold that last 30% just a couple of weeks ago um, because I basically needed the cash to put into another investment. So um, I think now is a pretty good time to revisit what the original investment thesis was, what went wrong, and what can we learn from this particular investment, and hopefully you can learn something from this as well. Um, I think it's Monish Pabrai or Warren Buffett that, that has always said, uh, it's much cheaper to learn from other people's mistakes than to go out and make them yourself. So I hope I do save you some money from sharing this story with you. So uh, let's go back to August 2019 because this is the date around which I first started buying into Fiat Chrysler as it was called at the time. So the original investment thesis for Fiat Chrysler was actually very simple. So um, this was a clone of Monish Pabrai. I was familiar with the business after following what Pabrai was doing and seeing this in his 13F. Uh, Pabrai, I should say, actually bought this way back in about 2012. So I was about seven years late to the party with this one. But nonetheless, it still looked very compelling to me at the time. So um, this is basically what had happened. So when Monish Pabrai first bought into Stellantis in sort of the early to mid 2010s, 
uh, again, the investment thesis was pretty simple. So at the time, the business was run by a guy by the name of Sergio Marchioni, who has unfortunately since passed away. Um, but the investment thesis was quite straightforward. So Motors Probri was buying Fiat Chrysler around 4 to $5 a share. And Fiat Chrysler had come out with this uh, sort of five-year business plan. So uh, from 2014 through to 2018. And in that business plan, uh, it said that in 2018, they expected to earn 4 to $5 a share. So if they could execute on that particular plan, um, they were trading at a PE of one based on 2018 earnings. If you were you know, buying in 2012 to 2014 kind of time and looking forward to 2018, they were trading at about a PE of one on those future earnings. And of course, uh, quality, well-managed, growing businesses don't tend to trade at a PE of one. Uh, and by the time I got around to looking at this investment, uh, Fiat Chrysler had basically executed on that plan. So they earned the four to five dollars a share, and the share price actually went as high as about twenty-eight dollars per share. So, so Manish Pabrai captured over a five x return, at least on paper, on that investment. He didn't actually sell a stake when it was in the high twenties, um, but that's kind of where it was when I sort of first got familiar with Fiat Chrysler. Now. Uh, what happened next is basically a couple of key things happened. So the first thing is Sergio Marchioni stepped down from the business before, like I say, unfortunately passing away. Uh, and the reins were handed over to Mike Manley, who was actually at the time uh, the head of Jeep, I believe. So, so Fiat Chrysler is kind of a... Um, not the ideal name for the business because it doesn't really describe their main brands. So their main brands in terms of a revenue perspective are Jeep, Ram Trucks. Uh, they also own Alfa Romeo, Maserati. And since merging with the PSA group, they have a much larger portfolio of brands as well. So in 2019, the investment thesis was basically the same as what Monus Pabrai had done with his first investment. So um, the price went from $28 a share right down to about $12 per share when I started buying in, about $12 or $13. And in 2019, 2018 that actually released a new business plan so one that looked forward through to 2022 and um, I will put up a screenshot here of that business plan uh, a lot of the numbers here are in euros so I'll convert things to US dollars because they traded in the US also and that's where I actually bought the shares um, but that comes out to about seven to nine dollars per share that they were expecting to earn in 2022 so um, if they're expecting to earn anywhere from seven to nine dollars share price was about 13 when I was buying, they were trading at a future PE of about 1.5. So not as attractive as when Probri was buying in, but no business that's growing and well-managed, like I say, trades at a PE of 1.5. So um, I felt that um, there was a good amount of upside potential if this did work out well. And if it didn't work out that well, I think it was trading at about four or five times earnings at the time. Uh, and I saw relatively muted downside. So I had a good margin of safety in this investment. And the other thing that also came along in this investment thesis, which I sort of thought of as like a bit of a bonus or free lottery ticket as, as Pabrai might describe it, was also the fact that uh, Fair Chrysler for a long time had been interested in merging with one of the other big automakers. So um, this is something that Sergio Marchioni talked about a lot before his passing. Uh, he did a very famous presentation called Confessions of a Capital Junkie and basically talked through all of the duplicate R&D spending across various automakers makers and uh, sort of touted the efficiencies that would be gained by merging some of the automakers that make uh, you know parts that are basically the same but they're each spending money to develop you know a car horn for example so if you merge two businesses together you can have the same horn in many different brands of vehicles and you don't have to uh, spend money on R&D to produce that same part twice now the horn is just one example but uh, there's a long list of examples where those types of savings and sort of synergies I guess can can be made so um, that was sort of a free lottery ticket that kind of came into the picture later in the investment and if you run some of the basic numbers through um, in terms of the impact on earnings uh, you could actually come up pretty conservatively with a potential increase of about an extra 20% in earnings so um, if they could execute on this 2022 business plan as well as get some um, good efficiency gains from the merger you were probably looking at a future PE of far less than one at the time I was buying and Fiat Chrysler were also sort of building this reputation for spinning off businesses. So they famously spun off Ferrari a few years ago. Uh, they had paid a lot of special dividends up until that point. And uh, with the merger that ended up happening with the PSA group, they actually ended up paying about a 16% uh, one-off dividend, which is uh, a very nice addition for any investor as well. So that's sort of a summary of the original investment thesis. 
Automakers are not high quality businesses at all. They have uh, a lot of operational leverage, which I'll get into very shortly. They're a very capital intensive business, but Fiat Chrysler at the time was just so, so cheap that I still thought that it looked attractive and more than justified sort of the lower business quality that I was getting in this investment. So from about August through to October 2019, I started buying Fiat Chrysler shares about once a month and I bought about four different lots of Fiat Chrysler um, and my average price was somewhere in the $12 to $13 range. So uh, that's when I built up my stake and let's move on to sort of what happened next in terms of uh, what changed with Fiat Chrysler's business. So there were really two key things that caused this investment to go south for me. So um, the first thing was to do with the 2022 business plan. This was a far smaller concern than the next one that I will get to. Um, but I did sort of notice that over time they were starting to talk less and less about this business plan. So when Sergio Marchionne was at the helm and they had their initial 2014 to 2018 plan, they talked about it a lot and how well they were executing and sort of how they were progressing to meet that plan. Now I noticed that in the conference calls with Mike Manley um, for, for the 2018 to 2022 business plan, they talked about it a lot less frequently. It was mentioned um, about 10 times, I think, if you do like a control F search for a particular word in the annual report. Uh, they did mention the business plan quite a few times in there, but it sort of just started to get less and less talked about, which was a little bit concerning and something I was keeping an eye on. But then of course, March 2020 happened and we started to have global lockdowns. And that's what really changed this investment for me. Now, one of the core learnings from this particular investment is this concept of operational leverage. So um, Fiat Chrysler were producing about $100 billion or so in revenue. They had a very substantial amount of revenue from the company. Um, but in a good year, they were only capturing about 3 to $4 billion of that in net income. So they only had about a 3 or 4% margin. Now, uh, what happens with a lot of these capital intensive businesses is anytime you have sort of a decline in sales, you have a rather large decline in earnings. So if your um, revenue drops, say 10% from 100 billion to 90 billion, that doesn't mean that your earnings also drop 10% from 3 billion to say 2.7 billion. Um, you really have a much larger impact than that on uh, earnings when you have this operational leverage. So a, a better way to think about it would be if, if revenue drops from 100 billion to 90 billion, uh, earnings can quite often go from say three or four billion to like negative five billion. They can have a huge decline uh, in earnings with even just a modest uh, decline in revenue. So um, I started to sort of understand that and see that as the first quarter 2020 results started to come out for Fiat Chrysler um, at times when they had, you know, factory closures and they had to slow down production lines and so on. And what really sort of pushed me over the edge, I guess, in terms of starting to sell Fiat Chrysler, realizing that uh, my thesis is basically broken, was uh, this line from a Monish Prabhai shareholder letter actually. So someone kindly sent this to me. Um, and this is basically what he said. So he said, in 2004, when Sergio Marchionne arrived at Fiat Chrysler, the company was losing $100 million a week. When these industrial machines are cranking, the operating leverage is breathtaking. But when economies of scale, volume, styling, engineering prowess, and consumer taste do not come together in a perfect symphony, watch out. There are too many moving parts, and this falls into the too hard pile. As I write this, we own no shares of Fiat Chrysler. So for Monish Prabhai, he ended up selling out of Fiat Chrysler um, pre or sort of in the midst of um, these global lockdowns starting to happen. And I basically started to look at the numbers and essentially did close to the same thing. So uh, when I looked at the first quarter results for Fiat Chrysler in 2020, they had losses of $1.8 billion in that quarter. Now, keep in mind that in that quarter, only sort of the back end of those first three months of 2020, uh, was impacted by lockdown. So to lose $1.8 billion in even just a partially affected quarter was kind of frightening to me, honestly. And keep in mind that uh, Fair Chrysler's market cap at the time was about 18 or $19 billion. So uh, they'd lost about 10% of their market cap in terms of uh, earnings in a single quarter, perhaps even maybe half a quarter that was affected. So if you annualize even that $1.8 billion losses out, you come to a loss of about $7 billion over a year if they were to you know have this long drawn out 
uh, you know, closure basically. And uh, at the time there was a lot more uncertainty than there is today around uh, sort of reopening and getting factories up and running and so on. So that's the way I was starting to think about it. And if they did, you know, have massive annualized losses of like $7 billion, that's like 40% of your market cap uh, and cash flows just evaporating from the business, which is a pretty scary thought for automakers. And this, why, this is why a lot of them tend to go bankrupt when crises happen. So, uh, you know, there's, there's very small small numbers of uh, automakers that have never gone bankrupt. So if anyone frankly was in a, in a position to deal with it, it probably was Fiat Chrysler. There's many other businesses like Ford and GM that had massive amounts of debt. Fiat Chrysler actually had net cash at the time. So they, they did have a very strong balance sheet, but nonetheless, uh, your very strong balance sheet can only keep you going for so long. So that's the way that I started to think about it. Um, and then in terms of what I did with my holding, um, I basically sold about 70% of my stake. So I, I bought at about 12 or $13 a share, and I sold about 70% of my position at $8.20 per share. So I did take about a 35% or so loss at that time, uh, made the decision, like I say, to only sell about 70% and held about 30% really glad I did. I held that sort of as what Charlie Munger might call schmuck insurance, you know, basically uh, just making sure that you don't completely screw it up if this thing does work out pretty well. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, the share price is now down to $8. And if they can turn this business around and the stars sort of align on this 2022 business plan, they're now trading at one or potentially even less than one times earnings if, if things do go well. So it was exceptionally, exceptionally cheap if they did execute on that plan. Uh, but nonetheless, I saw the potential at least for a massive permanent loss of capital if the, the closures and so on did continue onwards because of all of this operational leverage. <laughs> So that's what happened with the majority of my stake and I actually was a kind of a couple of months late to selling that um, after seeing uh, all the results in the Pabri, the Pabri letter and everything. Uh, but I ended up selling that on the 7th of May 2020, like I say, at $8.20 per share. So to sum everything up with this investment, I basically have four key lessons that I really learned out of investing in Fiat Chrysler. Now, the first thing is I have a much greater appreciation for the concept of operational leverage. Now, a lot of people talk about operational leverage in a positive context. So with a software business or something, as they continue to grow their number of users, they often don't have a lot of incremental costs. So think of something like Google, for example, once they've set up all of their infrastructure and uh, basically set up their platform, Every time they had an increase in um, ad revenue from you know selling ads on their various platforms, they don't have a lot of costs that come along with that. So they have this operational leverage effect where their margins kind of get better and better and better over time. So I now have a much greater appreciation for operational leverage when it works the other direction. So uh, when revenue drops, which it can for some of these more cyclical um, automotive type businesses, I now have a much greater appreciation for just how incredibly uh, quickly some of these companies can burn cash if revenue drops. So that's the first major lesson that, that I have learned which is kind of something that I hadn't considered a whole lot before investing in Fiat Chrysler. Uh, the second thing I learned, uh, or at least kind of reinforced, of course, um, I already knew what margin of safety was, but it just reinforced the, the need for a margin of safety. So um, I ended up only getting about a 16% loss from this investment. Now that's because I sold the bulk of my stake at about a 35% or so loss, but I actually held on to some and even made a gain on it. So I was buying at 12 or 13, and just a couple of weeks ago, I sold at about $18.40 a share. So um, I did make a gain on that. And I actually got quite a bit of capital back through a special dividend, like I said earlier, about a 16%, you know, one-off kind of special dividend, and actually a small spin-off of one of their parts businesses, which I've sold the shares of to, to capture the cash at this point. Um, but a few nice things in terms of getting capital back. So um, really reinforce that margin of safety is extremely important. Uh, if I was to buy into a high flyer type company, pay a very high valuation, and then something like this happened, I could see myself losing much, much more than 16% of my capital. So um, to have basically everything go wrong and get out with only a 16% haircut, I think is a pretty good outcome, quite honestly. So really reinforce the, the requirement for a margin of safety and also a strong balance sheet um, when I buy into a business so that they can survive some of these times. So that's the first couple of things I learned. Uh, the third thing is around holding that 30% stake. So 
um, this might sort of be resulting in just, you know, being happy about it because it worked out well and not kind of necessarily because it was a good decision or not. But I'm kind of happy that I had the flexibility of, uh, you know, my investment mind to be able to hold on to a small stake in that business. I wasn't uh, one of these people that was thinking it's in sort of thinking about in sort of black and white terms of just sell everything or hold everything. I sold 70 percent but held 30 percent and that 30 percent actually worked out very well in terms of reducing my permanent loss of capital because that 30% that I did hold for sort of schmuck insurance actually ended up paying off quite well. So um, that's one thing that I learned as well. And the fourth and final lesson is actually a quote from Charlie Munger and this is something that Charlie Munger has actually said to Monash Pabrai in the past and that is that it's important to learn from your mistakes but don't learn too much. Now um, investing is a game of odds and probabilities. So <clears throat> as business analysts we have to try and understand um, each individual company that comes across our radar as best we can. We then have to understand the odds in terms of the price that we have to pay to buy into one of these businesses. And you know there's probabilities of various outcomes with any investment that you go into. So there is a strong probability in my mind at the time that Fiat Chrysler would work out very well. You know good upside, very limited downside, but there are things that can come out of left field and just blow an investment thesis apart. And uh, you know a pandemic happened to be one of them. So um, I think it's important to learn but not learn too much. And I've said this to a couple of people now that I think if I were to assess something like Fiat Chrysler again and it was one of these future peeve one situations again honestly i think i would make this bet a second time i think i would go into this investment um and i think i'd do it again i i think that something came out of left field that really caused this to not work out but i think the odds were stacked in my favor and that's one of the reasons why i was probably able to get out of this thing with a relatively modest loss in capital so those are my four main learnings from Fiat Chrysler and that is sort of the story of this investment. So I do hope you enjoyed it and I hope you maybe learned a couple of things from it and hopefully um, I've saved you from making uh, mistakes with similar types of businesses into the future. Like I say, it's much cheaper to learn from my mistakes than it is to go out and make them yourself. So I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit like and hit subscribe. If you're interested in the Hatch offer, feel free to head to the link hatch.as forward slash investing with Tom. But that's it from me for this one and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.